And welcome back to another Podcasters Row. This is King of Podcast. Thank you all of you for welcoming you to another program. And I uh, appreciate all of you that have found the program at kingofpodcasts.com. And of course, you've been all to go ahead and subscribe to the show. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all other major podcast platforms. And my next guest today is a great example of when you're going to do a podcast because you can relate, because you lived it. And when I saw a story that came across from my guest, she is the host of a podcast and author of lovefraud.com. She's written eight books about spotting, escaping, and recovering from sociopaths. She's developed Love Fraud Education, offering webinars for survivors and professionals. She's presented scientific research on personality disorders and has shared her expertise on numerous TV, radio, and online programs. The program is the True Love Fraud Stories podcast. I'm here with Donna Anderson. Donna, I, I'm amazed by your story. And I before we even get started, I really do appreciate the fact that you've decided to put your own story out there and you've taken it to another level to share other people's stories of the same kind of fate. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you, George. And uh, yeah, um, I actually got into this whole scenario because I married a man who was a con man. Uh, this guy took a quarter of a million dollars from me. He cheated with at least six different women during our two and a half year relationship. He had a child with one of those women, and then 10 days after I left him, he married the mother of the child, which was the second day he committed bigamy. So the second time he committed bigamy. And so anyway, oh, let me see. Well, no, well the thing that. is, too, is that within the story, I just want to think a few things that you've already talked about. When you have the, the story that is one of the podcasts is three lessons from marrying a, a sociopath. The thing you mentioned was he claimed to be a Hollywood scriptwriter, an entrepreneur, a special forces operator. Really grandiose things, but also the, the, the a lot of telling signs of a sociopath. But the other thing, too, was you always had some skepticism beforehand because of the fact he said his previous wife had died four months prior, but now he's back, you know, on the market again. It's just everything he did, plus the, what he's able to go and do to continue to keep communication with you. Like, he really worked hard to keep up this this facade this entire time, and also in the same way... You being, I mean, you know, logically you were starting to see some red flags, but it was hard because the love bombing, what he did to go and make you fall in love, that there were just certain things that might have felt too good to be true, that it couldn't be real. And nevertheless, he got to get you where you were, but you're not one of the only victims. There are many out there. Absolutely. In fact, um, you know, my ex-husband, I wasn't his only victim. Uh, he he did the same thing to 20 or 30 other women that I found out about. In fact, in my divorce, I had uh, four other women plus the parents of the wife before me who died while they were married together. Uh, they all testified at my divorce. Mm. And, you know, the thing, a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, first of all, this happened back in 1996 which was before there was Google. So there wasn't an opportunity to uh, check up on people as you can today. So that was one thing. Well, let me ask and you other... quickly, where did you, now you would, he was in Australia, you're here in the States. So how did the connection happen? Was it online at that point? Because I know we already had online dating, very early steps of that. How did you actually connect? It was online and it was love at AOL. So, I mean, who's on America online anymore? Right. <laughs> And um, and at the time, there was no dating site. You know, people would just essentially it was all by email. You know, they would post a, it. Was essentially, it was just like the classifieds. You would post an ad and people would respond. And um, so this was 1996. And the thing to keep in mind is that one of the things sociopaths do is they move very quickly. And, you know, so although his story looks preposterous in hindsight, you know, when you first met this person and the way he would tell it with such confidence and, and such bravado, um, it, you know, it, it didn't seem unbelievable at the time. In fact, it, it wasn't until um, I actually left him and contacted some of the other women that I realized the whole thing was a financial scam. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the reason I left him was because I found out that he was cheating on me. 
But you know, I, I, I thought that was the problem. I, it right. never occurred to me that this was all intentional uh, until I uh, contacted the other women and, and started to find out that he had done the same thing to them. Now, obviously, with all the research you've done, and also from your own personal, I'm sure your own personal journey to understand what happened. One of the things I always I ask myself, and always when I've talked to other women that might have also gone through their own share of trauma, is what is it about past experiences that might have made them vulnerable to something like this? What have you learned from the the victims and those that have, uh, professionals that have talked about this? Because it's one of those things where a sociopath, a sociopath is going to be able to prey upon that victim if they know there's certain traits about them that make them vulnerable and easy to go ahead and apply their trait. Well, first of all, the key thing to understand is that everybody is vulnerable. Okay. I mean, there, there are no traits that just make this person more vulnerable than that person, because essentially a vulnerability means that you want something. Okay. We all want something. You know, we, we all want a, a, a partner. We all want a good job. We all want success. So what sociopaths do is that they very, in a very calculated way, they figure out what your vulnerability is, mm-hmm. and then they use that in order to, to snag you. So it's it's not the case where you know people who get into this situation have low self esteem uh, or they aren't smart or, or something along those lines. In fact, most of the the women that I talk to are, are all professionals, and you know, I, in fact, I I do have some information about that. Is that you know they a, a sociopath will target somebody with assets because what's the point? <laughs> you know, if, if they're to, you know, to get something for you, from you that you, you, they want to target somebody who has something that they can offer. So, um, and, and plenty of people, I mean, first of all, there are female sociopaths as well who target men. So I've, I've heard those stories and, you know, they operate in all realms of society. So there, it's not necessarily just romantic partners, uh, you know, business con artists, you know, these, these are people who are essentially the same thing. There's, there's lots of business leaders who take down entire companies. If you remember like Enron and, uh, you know, that one, that guy who was the head of Enron was a, clearly a psychopath. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so he, he, I mean, how many people lost money in that deal? So they, they operate, it's essentially they're opportunists and, you know, they'll take advantage of whatever comes their way. Well, you think of like a Bernie Madoff in that professional sense. That was somebody who was a, a very much a master manipulator and was able to just go and keep this going, this pyramid scheme until it was finally found out. But then so much damage was done in the end. I agree with you on the part there that it, it's not so much where it's something about economic status or professional asset or, you know, just your education. But I do feel like there's something about the vulnerability of looking for love and looking for someone to appreciate you, to bond with in some way, shape, or form. I feel like that's one of those things where that is a vulnerability that a lot of people have. And that's one of those things. But also, was it something where it's become a ba- a pattern of what, where things came and this is the worst case scenario is finding someone that and in love with that ultimately not didn't just want to break your heart, but also just break your spirit. There are plenty of sociopaths predators who do that. And the thing is that you can be vulnerable because of your history. I mean, I do talk to plenty of people who um, had disordered families growing up, you know, where their mother or father was disordered. And, And there's a lot of that. And essentially, in many cases, people like this do, you know, hook up with somebody who's just like their mother or father. Right. But then I also talk to plenty of people who had wonderful childhoods and, you know, never had any issues at all. So what happens there is that they're totally blindsided. You know, they, they come into life, you know, believing that everybody has good inside and, and we all just want to be loved. And so they, they just don't have, they cannot conceive of somebody who treats them the way that they eventually discovered the sociopath has treated them. Um, The other thing that can happen is that people have misconceptions about themselves. I mean, that's one of the things that happened to me. I mean, I didn't have a a dysfunctional childhood, you know, the the usual stuff, but, you know, nothing outlandish. Nobody got arrested or drug problems or anything along those lines. But I did get um, a thought in my mind that I needed to 
um, be smart enough for people, you know, and, and that I, I had to do for people in order for somebody to want, want me. Right. And so that was just, it, it was, you know, I don't know where it came from. It, it was just something you pick up, you know, going through life. And so, you know, that ended up being a vulnerability for me. And that made it that, you know, so that I, I didn't have a, a, a fulfilling dating life, I guess you could say, and, until I met this guy. And then he told me everything I wanted to hear. Right. So, you know, I mean, they, they just, it, it's, I mean, anybody is vulnerable. Um, I've heard, I've, I've heard of specialists in psychopathy, psych, you know, researchers who've been taken, you know, so it, it's even when you know about it, you, you could still be vulnerable because you may not see you may not expect it to happen to you, you know, and and so you, you just don't miss. I, a friend of mine was a, was an interrogator in the army, right. and he got in a situation, you know. So it, it can absolutely happen to anybody. No, I agree with you. No one is. I mean, if anybody can be prone to it. I agree with that. This is not any isolated situation or just a particular profile. Somebody that gets to that, but it's amazing how much psychological psychological issues that people have from the family background or coming up because of the fact of the love life not being fulfilling or sustaining because we have all these standards that were given to us, you know, especially with you and I growing up, we had traditional values of marriage and, you know, relationships. But right now, per generation, you know, generation Z, millennials, this point, I don't even know how it could even happen because in the days where you're seeing more divorce than ever, you're seeing People that are not even in relationships anymore, they prefer, none of them call it friends with benefits anymore. It's called situationships. You know, and dating apps are such a brick wall now. Because compared to the dating apps, I remember a little bit, AOL, I remember being very effective. I mean, a lot of women on those sites, on that site, mm-hmm. eHarmony, Yahoo Personals, all those were effective. And I remember mm-hmm. because AOL, because it was the messenger that you actually had as well, you had a way to go and communicate easily. There was no, not a whole lot of thing of, uh, you didn't have to pay for it at that time. It wasn't even a premium at that point. So it was easy to go ahead and access people. But with every one of these things, you leave yourself vulnerable because, and everybody, there's millions upon millions that are on dating sites now or meeting up. And for those that are really interested in just finding someone to settle down with, you know, sometimes the dream can be too much to, to too good to be true, but there's so many victims. There's so many books about it. And let me make this point too. Just in the last couple of months, I've gone through books where I wanted to learn and understand where I re- talked about, I read books about gaslighting, healing from mm-hmm. hidden abuse and coercive control. A couple of books I've actually picked up on Audible that I was listening to and got a lot of insight. The idea is that you can see these traits in a lot of people that just feel like not everyone is, you know, psychologically sound or mentally healthy. And there's a lot of that going on. But it's for those that decide to go this route and say, well, I'm going to take this out on people. I'm going to go and use this manipulation and, you know, get what I want. Well, first of all, uh, the problem is massive. Um, I say that typically about 12 percent of the population are what I would call a sociopath. And um, I use the term sociopath as an umbrella term for multiple uh, clinical disorders because the, the terminology is is it's like very confusing right. and essentially there are people who could have antisocial narcissistic borderline histrionic or psychopathic personality disorder and and they're not all precisely the same but there's a lot of overlap and what they have in common is that they exploit and manipulate people and so i refer to all of them collectively as sociopaths which was the original meaning of the term when when the term was coined like back in 1930 that's what it meant anything you know pathological in social relations so so that's what the term originally meant uh there, there's discrepancies about that now but anyway if you take all the people who could be diagnosed with one of those five disorders and add them up and there's a a, a, b- a bunch of studies that have done this the range is from about six and a half percent to 17 percent of the population so if you take the midpoint, 12%, you know, you're looking at 12% of the population could have one of these disorders. So, you know, we're talking about 30 million people in the United States. And, uh, you know, so, so they are everywhere. They're in all demographic groups. They're in all economic groups. They're in all geographic locations. 
And unfortunately, we don't know this. You know, people aren't telling us about this. Nobody's talking about, you know, the folks that are, are fundamentally different from the rest of us. You know, they, they simply, their motivations are not the same. And the reason is what, what's the bottom line with these people is that they do not have the ability to authentically love. I mean, that's what's missing in, in these folks. And it, it manifests in different ways, but they, they literally do not have the ability to care about somebody else um, other than how it, it affects them. You know, they, they, they like to have, you know, a good looking girl on the arm or, or, or something along those lines. Right. But to be authentically caring about someone else's well-being and health and uh, prosperity, they just can't do it. And that's one of the fundamental things about what real love is, is real love is you care about somebody else's health and well-being and, and they just, they, they don't do it. You know, they, it's all about them. It's all about their entitlement. And, you know, so consequently, they do not have the ability to authentically love. And one of those things too, is that when people are getting into commitments now, and also the same thing with the fact that with your, with, with uh, the relationship that you went through, that the red person was in Australia, the, 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 the this distance, the chance not to go and really learn about someone's family and find out what the structure was and what they got to, you know, grow up with two healthy parents in the household and, and they had family and they had a lot of love around them. For me, I know that, you know, I got extended family, a lot of love and family, but one of those things was a void for me was, you know, I didn't have relationships in high school. I got picked on in high school. I was bullied. So I didn't want to put any other girl into the crossfire of what I was getting for that. And then after that, I was just late at everything and just being awkward at everything I was trying to figure out just to, you know, just to find a relationship because I wasn't, I didn't know how to properly love, didn't know how to do that. Just the one of the idea of it, but I had no, nothing else after that. And I'll tell you, I've never been afraid to go say the fact that I probably was also, you know, I, I there was a book from uh, Dr. Robert Glover, no more Mr. Nice Guy. Excellent book for any guy out there that's trying to understand if they're not in love and they're single, that in that book, it really showed me that I had manipulative uh, tactics of my own and I was using that on other women because I was trying to get, first of all, I was chasing the wrong women, the wrong kind of women, and I also was trying to get something that I wanted from it, which was just attention and love and all that, but I it was all the wrong reasons. And it made me for years reflect on what I was doing wrong. And I can understand where from the mindset of the guys based on what they went through. And it could be, you know, where my, I like a great family structure, but you know, if we don't, if guys don't have the opportunity to go ahead and properly like go on dates and go on relationships and actually, you know, try to be you know, with a girlfriend and properly go the route and sincerely, you know, make a good effort of it. If we don't know how to do that. And we're now at the point where, I mean, how many girls and guys are going out with each other now today? It's not even happening. Plus there's a the confusion now of, you know, how many young girls and guys, you know, don't know what their identity and gender is. They're, they're getting confused about that too. All this accounts to just a, a storm of, toxicity and a lot of bad relationships where, I mean, what young guy and girl's going to come out of, you know, their teens and twenties without being emotionally damaged? Well, I mean, it is still possible. Uh, right. <laughs> um, and I mean, the thing it's is a lot harder though, but still, it's still, it could be, I, I, I wouldn't argue. I mean, it was hard when I was young, which yeah. was a long time ago, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and that's the thing, you know, is that, Growing up and learning how to love is difficult, right? Okay, and and that's just the way it is. But for some reason, you know, today people think that it's it's supposed to be, you know, you just slide right into it, and and you don't have to make an effort, and you don't have to look at your own behavior, and, and yeah, and and you don't have to learn how to be considerate. So you know, I, I agree that um, things are probably a lot more difficult now. Um, and I do attribute a lot of that to the influence of um, technology and social media, right. um, you, you know, because one of the things that happens, like, it, is, you know, people who are going on dating sites, any dating app, anything like that, need to understand that they are full of predators. OK, I mean, first of all, there are the, the out and out predators who are on these sites. And then there's all the other people who are just swiping left, swiping right, you know, without a, a whole lot of look right. uh, thought about what they're doing. But what happens on, an, on any of these sites is that 
experts understand that the true meaning of human communication um, is 65 to 90 percent nonverbal. Okay, it's tone of voice. It's your gestures, it's your body language, all these other things. So if you're meeting somebody and having most of your relationship via text or online or something like that, what that means is that 65 to 90% of the meaning of the message is missing, okay? So what we do is that when we look at these messages, you see a text or something like that, you interpret it to mean what you want it to mean. And that means... If you're falling in love, you're falling in love with your own fantasy. I want to ask about the podcast itself. I don't know how you do it, but I got to ask you, in the, some of the stories I've gotten to go ahead and sample through of your podcast you've done so far, there has to be some emotional fortitude that you have to have to not break down and cry with some of the stories because you realize this is something like I, I went through. And it's like another person is victimized. And it's like you hear the kind of thing, I mean, obviously, you know, it's not a matter of comparing stories. They're all horrible and tragic. But you decided to go ahead and not only, you know, share your story, which is also extremely tough. I'm sure the first time it came around, it's gotten much easier, I would imagine, because more people get to hear us and you realize the good it's doing. But then you still hear there are still these men and women that are still getting hurt. Well, um, the reason I can do that is because I have recovered. Okay. And, you know, that's part of the message of this, that recovery is possible. Right. It is, I mean, it's, it's work and it's, it's a bumpy ride, but it, it absolutely is possible. And the thing is, is that not only can you recover from, you know, whatever bad things happen with this jerk that you got involved with, right. but you can also recover from whatever came before that made you vulnerable. Mm. Okay. And, and so I've, I've been through that process. I, I can say that it's it's bumpy. You know, I spent a lot of time curled up on the floor crying. Yeah. Um, but what happens is, is that, you know, once you process that, once you process that pain, and it, it the way I describe it is that, you know, when we have all these emotional wounds that we've experienced, um, and, and typically, you know, we're not taught to deal with our emotional problems. You know, we, we're, we're taught to, you know, pick yourself up, get up and go, you know, get back on the horse, you know, or something like that. So because of that, we're, a lot of us are walking around with these emotional wounds from things that happened, you know, from last week back to childhood. So the key is to learn how to process that stuff. And what that means is that you allow yourself to feel the wounds, you allow yourself to feel the pain, and in the process of that, amazing thing happens is that it goes away. You know, when when you can really sit with the, the, the pain of what you've experienced and, and tolerate it, it just starts to dissipate. So the more you can do that, the more you get it out of your system. So what happens is, you know, you're getting this this negative energy out of your system from what you've experienced. You're releasing it. And then the next step is that you want to replace that with positive energy. You want to replace it with anything that makes you happy, anything that you love to do. And the more you can do this, the more you your center of uh, balance shifts inside and the more you can open yourself up to wonderful experiences. Now, I mean, I'm remarried, you know, I'm, I'm with my second husband. We've Congrats. been together for more than 20 years. Wow. And, you know, it, it's a wonderful relationship. We're very happy. Mm -hmm. And in all honesty, had I not gone through that process of my emotional recovery, I may not have encountered him. And I, and I may not have been able to, to really, you know, recover and move forward. Congratulations. That That's real recovery. The fact you were able to go ahead and find, after all that, you did find that, that love, the relationship that you wanted with all the experience that you have now so that so well-rounded and that's a great thing. And also that, you know, that he understands what you went through and that he was able to be so compassionate and so loving and so supportive. That's wonderful. Not a lot of people get that part. Now, what I also look at too, is that I also feel like you said a really important thing right there about be able to go and find yourself again, to rediscover who you are and, I think that's another thing I also see with a lot of women and even guys as well, where when young women are traumatized and early on, when you, I see a lot of young women that, you know, they go right into changing their bodies, changing their looks, adding tattoos, changing their hair, 
piercings and just doing things to just we're number one we have women that are young women that are having the beauty standard that's been constantly changed and crafted and moved around multi-billion dollar industry that creates this facade that this is what's supposed to be and the social media has just intensified it amplified it it's made it worse so everybody's trying to compete with each other and it's like it's not real it's not reality it's not realistic but everybody's caught up in it. It's like they have to feel like they need to live this kind of lifestyle, this kind of clout, this kind of status. And I feel like social media has really been a contributor. While we might get information, we might be able to connect with other people. But there's a competition that nobody wins from this. And I think there's not enough people that understand that they get traumatized. They can't. I, I've always looked at where I thought acceptance and commitment therapy was actually a pretty good route to go when it comes to therapy. I went to therapy twice. Understanding and reflecting back, and and going back and just thinking over and over what all the things that happened, and learning from it. Without trying to lose myself, I don't think a lot of people get a chance to do that or find a way to be able to become their original self again. My thing is that I haven't gotten it all completely back. I'm still very cynical very critical and skeptical of a lot of things. So it's not all the way back, but it's as close as I can get. But what do you see about those that when they go through things like this, that are not able to get themselves back, because I think it's harder to get back to who you are at the core. I don't want to say that there's anybody who can't get better. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, in, in my view, um, just about everybody can get better. And um, a couple of things are required. You know, first of all, I mean, the first step is to understand what happened to you. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so that's one of the things that I'm doing with the podcast with the True Love Fraud Stories is to tell these stories or, or have the people who experienced it tell the stories and, you know, really grasp uh, what that experience was like. And th that's a twofold thing. First of all, it educates people about how, how the predators operate you know, when, when they see what happened in these stories. And secondly, for those who have been through it, it's validation, you know, because I, and I've had plenty of people come to me and say, you'll never believe what happened, you know, and, and nobody believes me and everybody thinks I'm crazy and all this other stuff. So, so that's one of the objectives of telling the story. But the other thing is that I, I really believe in, and, you know, there's a second part to, to my podcast program in that, I have a, a second podcast called um, Love Fraud Live, which I've been doing on um, YouTube for three or four years now, and I've, I've made that contingent, you know, with the with the True Love Fraud Stories podcast. But that's more like a, a, an, an informal support group, and it's an idea to help people understand what's going on, and you know, so that you can take the steps to recover, um, because. I mean, it, it, it can be difficult. Some people have come from absolutely horrific backgrounds. Um, sometimes you do need professional care. Uh, you know, there are folks, and, and essentially there are, there's a specialty now that wasn't like, you know, when I learned about this stuff, it's, it's a, a trauma specialty. You know, there are psychologists who, you know, become certified in, in dealing with trauma, therapists who deal with trauma. But the other thing that happens is that not all mental health professionals understand this. And I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to people who have gone to therapy and the therapist just doesn't get it. They, they don't understand what, what the experience is like. Um, they're trying to figure out, you know, well, you know, what, what did you do that was wrong? And, and what's your trust issues and everything? Well, the guy's lying to me all the time. That's why I have trust issues, you know? Right. So, you know, people, you know, they, there are in fact, our research shows that approximately half of therapists do not understand what goes on in these situations. So for that reason, you know, when I talk to people and, and you're talking about therapy, I say, you know, if, if, if it's not working for you, you know, find somebody else, you know, because they, they don't all get it. One of the things I also notice is that when it comes to therapy, obviously any therapist that's going to be able to go ahead and try to help and assist someone that's been victimized of anything. It's really just the education that they have at their disposal. They really don't have the personal account of what they went through themselves, which is one thing that's really amazing and early cathartic, that the fact that if you're talking to victims, you lived it yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a better connection than most therapists would have with others when you've taught yourself and educated yourself all these years after. 
and I've gone through a healthy relationship now for 20 plus years, you have a better sense of understanding a victim than the therapists do. What, well, what do you I can't... that part that you would say that for other people that, you know, they realize they should come and see if someone like you can actually help them in the same way. Or if uh, those are trying to find someone as a support group that but actually comes to this level that way you can give. What do you think about that part where maybe that in the therapy community, if there were more people that were able to go and have those that experienced it and recovered that could properly speak to this and help someone really bring out what really what happened to them instead of having them blocked in their in their mind? Well, I can say that the therapists who best understand it have all experienced it themselves. And, um, you know, I've got, we offer webinars uh, through lovefraud.com and, you know, they're presented by various therapists and every single one of them has had their own issue, you know? And, and so, you know, that's, that's what, um, that's critical. You know, if, 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 those, those are the people who really understand what's going on. And there is an issue in what well, it's, it's not as bad as it was, you know, because, you know, when I went through this in, in 1996, there was like barely any discussion about sociopaths anywhere. In fact, when I launched Love Fraud in 2005, we were one of the first websites on the internet talking about sociopaths. And um, I mean, now there's a lot more general knowledge of what happened. But, you know, if, if you've been go- going to a therapist who studied, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, you know, before they even had a way of evaluating whether or not someone was a psychopath, then, you know, they did not get the type of information that, that they need. Right. And, the, and the other thing is that, you know, one of the things that therapists are taught is to have a positive regard for everybody. Okay, so that means that, you know, whoever comes into your office, you know, you you have to, you know, uh, understand that, you know, try and help them, you know, believe what they're saying and all this other stuff. So what happens is, especially if you have like couples counseling and a couple people go in and one of them is disordered and and the other is, you know, trying to sort out what's going on. And a disordered person frequently can get the therapist on their side, you know, because of of their, you know, their manipulation skills and everything. And the therapists are not taught to be questioning. You know, they're they're not taught to look at somebody and say, "Hmm, you know, what 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 exactly is this person's agenda?" You know, it's positive regard for everybody. Mm-hmm. So, you know, consequently, you know, and that's that's what they're taught. Now, you know, after they get burned <laughs> through their own experiences, you know, then then they they know better. But I, I've had multiple therapists tell me that their training was deficient; that it did not prepare them. For, for their own experiences, let alone to help somebody else. Wow. You know, and I always wonder if that's something that you can ask if you're trying to good and find a therapist to help. If somebody's looking for a therapist, if that's something they can ask about, if that therapist has some sure. expertise in their field. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and the thing is, yeah, yeah the, the thing is that, you know, I mean, they all have a class on sociopaths or, or something like that. Right. But, um, you know, do they really understand what's going on? And, you know, the, the ones who have been there themselves are the ones who can truly help. It right away. The other thing, too, is I also notice, again, it's a lot about the stories of fraud and a lot of manipulation, gaslighting, narcissism that's out there. How close does it actually tie in, do you think, for those that, you know, even though there might have been something that the relationship goes away, but then the abuse is done, does it kind of parallel the same thing with those that are dealing with domestic abuse right now? Oh, there's a lot of overlap uh, between this type of manipulation and domestic abuse. In fact, um, we, we've conducted multiple studies, um, you know, based on our audience and, and completed surveys. Mm-hmm. And we, on um, multiple times we have asked those questions, you know, what type of abuse did you endure? Yeah. Well, you know, the top type of abuse is emotional or psychological, mm-hmm. you know, like 95% of people say that. And then um, the next most common, uh, common type of abuse is financial abuse. And, you know, so it, it the, the actual physical violence is usually fairly low down the list. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, luckily the domestic violence folks are, becoming aware of that. And that now they're talking about financial violence and financial abuse. Um, I mean, there used to be no information on that at all. 
but it, it's a thing. And in fact, it's, it's actually, you know, one of the tools that um, a sociopath will use to uh, inflict their coer- coercive control yeah. is to, you know, have somebody be, you know, financially in a box that they can't get out of. So, I mean, they're finally now starting to do research on that. But, you know, there's a lot more abuse that goes on than is physical violence. Donna, this is great. I really do love the, the fact that you're doing all this great work. It's honestly, it's yeoman's work. And I'm sure, I mean, what can you tell me about the feedback you've gotten and the audience has, that has attached to what you've done? Obviously, those that have come to your site and they've shared their story. What about those listeners that have, I mean, tell me about the kind of feedback you've gotten. If you got a chance to go ahead and uh, go out and speak to folks in person at webinars or any kind of events, the feedback you're getting well, it, it is a new podcast. You know, we only launched, um, gosh, six weeks ago or something like that. Wow. So I've, I've gotten a few comments. Um, I'm looking forward to perhaps participating in CrimeCon, you know, or uh-huh. something along those lines. Um, because uh, I, I set this up in the in the true crime stories genre, you know, because that's essentially what it is. Well, and, and, you know. it, feels like, it feels like something out of a Dateline NBC or Cold Case Files or something like that. It's like... One of these days, I'm expecting you on investigation discovery, something like that, for all we know. Oh, I've already been on there twice. And, and... <laughs> well, there you go. Thought about it. But now, also, before this, you also have written a lot of books. Like, so if you go to your Amazon page, there's a lot of books in terms of the areas of being seduced by a, a sociopath or understanding the sociopath, recovering and dealing with for seniors, and of course, uh, Love Fraud, How Marriage to a Sociopath, Fulfill My Spiritual Plan, all available on Kindle. And also in card cover paperback through Amazon and also all major book outlets. Um, now, when you decided to go from the books into the podcast, pretty easy transition? Well, for me, it was because my background is journalism. Okay. And, and uh, I mean, that's where I started out as, as a journalist. And for me, I, I'm really enjoying doing this stories, you know, because I'm a storyteller and this, this is, this is what I like. I mean, I like educating people and and that's been good, but I've been doing it for 20 years now. And, and so this is kind of a a new of of evolution for me Mm -hmm. to, to do it. And, and I wanted, I mean, I've been wanting to tell these stories. I mean, I've got more than 10,000 of them. You know, I mean, that's how many people have contacted me to share their stories. And because I want to make it real for people. I, I, I want them to understand how these things come about, how you fall for it, what the actual manipulation is. And, you know, because this is the best way to educate everybody is to tell what actually happened. Right. You know, I mean, even in a, like a survey, uh, um, you know, you, you check a box or something that that's not capturing the depth of, of what really goes on in these right. situations. So, so that's my objective in, um, in doing this. Also, like where the format comes in for the podcast itself, you have it very much, as, like you said, true crime. Feels like a true crime podcast. The way it's presented, it's, it definitely gives me the feel of NPR serial when I heard back, back about a decade ago. Has that feel to it. And I, it's, there's not, I mean, there's there's quite a few podcasts that do that, but uh, I like the way you've done it and presented it. It's well-rounded and very engaging. So, and, and again, only six weeks in, that's amazing. But you got a lot of content up there already so far. So you're not short of that for sure. And it's great what you've done so far. Uh, how Now, I also know there's multiple episodes, it looks like, per week. Um, is it What's the frequency of the podcast right now? What What is it you think you'll be able to go ahead and keep up with in terms of how often you can produce uh, content? Well, um, I wanted to front load it, you know, so we, you know, as we were starting. So, you know, right off the bat, uh, we put four episodes up. And, um, you know, just in order to, you know, I, I didn't want to just have one, <laughs> you know, and people come and everything. Right. So, um, and, and we're, I, it's probably going to be, um, the frequency will be, every, well, it's essentially with each of the true law fraud stories that we tell, mm-hmm. I also do an expert interview, right. you know, which is available through subscribers also. And um, so we'll, the first week we'll have the story. The next week will be the expert interview. Then we'll take a break and then we'll go through the cycle again. So it's probably, you know, two two weeks. Unless, of course, you know, in some cases like one that I'm working on now, 
Uh, I've got two related stories, you know, that are true love fraud stories and then the expert interview. So then we'll have three in a row. And, and then so it'll be, you know, either two or three weeks of coming out and then a break and then another two or three weeks of coming out. That's a lot to work off of. I'll tell you, and, uh, and a lot of binge, uh, also binge worthy. So if you're looking, in looking for that kind of thing where it's not just a episode per episode deal, this is obviously something where you just binge through. And there's a whole lot of story arcs behind it and a whole lot of stories are being told. And it's good that you're offering this platform out there based on just what you've gone through and allowing to go ahead and take that to channel this across to get the word out. Cause there's a lot of people that are being victimized by this. And this is a very important dot. I really appreciate you doing this for us. And now, Website again is lovefraud.com. Everything you need to go and know about the show and our books, podcast. Uh, how about speaking engagements? Do you need anything right now where people can go and build again, meet you in person at any time going forward? I don't have anything scheduled at the moment, but I have done that in the past. Um, so uh, as we get the, the um, show stabilized, uh, we'll see what the new opportunities will be. Right. So again, lovefraud.com. And any other things you want to go and point out in terms of social media or other things that people should go ahead and know about the entire Love Fraud Network? Well, um, the main thing is the website, uh, which you've talked about, which is great. Um, my most recent book is Senior Sociopaths, um, which uh, talks about sociopaths who are over the age of 50. And the reason I published that is because there is this um, common wisdom, I guess you could say, in the mental health field that sociopaths burn out in their 40s and aren't as bad. Totally false. No, I mean, no. you know, that's not true at all. Um, so I did the documentation on that. Uh, we do offer the webinars, uh, which are very inexpensive and taught by professionals as far as um, identifying and um, recognizing and, and how to recover from these situations. And then, of course, the podcast is the newest thing. And, and it's the subscriptions includes the ad-free versions of the story, the True Love Fraud story, plus uh, app, uh, access to the True um, the Love Fraud Live show, which is kind of like my informal support group. So, you know, people who subscribe get both of those. And um, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm looking forward to continuing to produce episodes. And, and I thank you so much for inviting me to your podcast, George. Hey, Donna, thank you again. I appreciate it. So hopefully Bill will get a chance to go and check out the program itself, True Love Fraud Stories. Also, you know, subscribing into the premium area to go and get to the expert interviews and so much more. Again, join with Donna Anderson of the True Love Fraud Podcast, True Love Fraud Stories Podcast. Thank you again for being on. Really appreciate you taking time out. Thank you, George. All right. And with that said, folks, that's going to do it for this program. But of course, more episodes to come. And I hope all of you will go ahead and Tune in for the next episode. As always, kingofpodcasts.com is where all my content's at, and we'll talk to you next time.